welcome. Uh, you should be joining us uh, live virtually for our partnership Houston Business Forum today. We have quite a few people that are joining us today, so we'll just give it another minute for everyone to log on. All right, about half of you have joined us uh, for this afternoon's webinar. Um, we do want to ensure that everyone has been able to join us before we begin. But for those that have joined, uh, welcome. My name is Carrie Broderson, and I am a head of our events and programs department here at the Greater Houston Partnership. If you take a moment to just look at your controls on your screen, your audio and video will be off. However, you'll be able to see and hear our presenter today. And um, if you also look at your controls, there is a chat feature at the bottom of your screen and a Q&A feature. The chat feature you can use right now if you're having any technical difficulties or you need to ask questions of the, um, the team behind the scenes. Uh, the Q&A feature is if you want to ask questions for Patrick when we move into the moderated Q&A section. So please note the difference between chat and the Q&A tab. We also will have our staff answering questions in the Q&A tab, and um, they may answer you in private mode or they will um, answer you uh, live. And we'll get to, again to that part of the program at the end after the presentation. So let's just give it just a little bit longer. We still have people joining us right now, and we'll start in about 25 seconds. All right, well, thank you everyone for joining us today and welcome back for many of you who uh, joined us for our webinar series last week where we had a, an event on small business disaster aid as well as a conversation on employment and workforce. We also had a special address from Bob Harvey to talk about the uh, Stay Home Work Safe program. Today's Forum is on our economy and an economic update will be presented by Patrick Jankowski, the Partnership Senior Vice President of Research, and we'll um, introduce him in just a moment. This series is just one way that the Greater Houston Partnership is working to support our business community uh, through this time. And, but we do have other resources we want you to be aware of beyond just the series. It includes our Houston.org coronavirus main site. This includes an assortment of resources, including public health, employee tools and tactics for coping with the pandemic. Um, but that is our main site and you have been uh, exposed to that site for um, a week now. We just launched actually yesterday, the Greater Houston Business Recovery Center the GHBRC, and you can find that at houston.org backslash recovery, and that is up and available for you. This site helps to aid companies in planning, programming, connecting 
um, to current recovery resources, including federal lending programs, local business assistance programs, and information about laws and regulations. So I invite you to start viewing that site, which is updated regularly now. We will also have two uh, webinars this week where we'll be hearing from Senator John Cornyn to talk about the CARE Act or the federal stimulus package, as well as a lender panel on Thursday. And they'll talk a little bit more about what is part of that payroll package as well. Um, please also note our WorkSafe company program that's at houston.org backslash WorkSafe. And then of course our business forum digital series is at houston.org COVID-19-business-forum. We also provide daily briefing emails. You may be receiving those now. If not, you can go ahead in the chat box and let our team know if you're not receiving that. Our member support hotline, if you will, is member.engagement at houston.org. And our team is actually standing by right now to take any of your emails. Our economic updates, Patrick Jankowski continues to provide those. And then we have our Greater Houston Partnership LinkedIn group. So please do um, access this information. Uh, these are great resources, great tools. So before we begin, let me just review again how we're conducting today's event. This is a presentation by Patrick Jankowski on the economy and he'll deliver a PowerPoint presentation. And then we will take a few minutes to go through questions and answers from the audience, which if you will submit your questions on the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. The chat feature is also functioning, but please do use that for any comments you might have or if you're having any technical difficulties at this time. And you can also use the raise your hand tool. It's a virtual tool that will allow us to know if you're having any difficulties as well, um, or potentially we can have someone from our behind the scenes team uh, connect with you um, privately. Also for best viewing of the screen, right now you're getting a larger screen showing our PowerPoint presentation, but you can also go to your view options tab at the top and you can do a side-by-side -side mode that allows you to see the speaker and the PowerPoint presentation in really a split screen. So at this time, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Patrick Jankowski. He is our Senior Vice President of Research at the Greater Houston Partnership. And um, he'll be taking you through the slides today, Patrick. Patrick, you're on mute. Okay. Gotcha. Can you hear me now? We can hear you. Okay. Thank you very much, Carrie. Thank you very much for the introduction and thank you very much everybody for, for joining for this presentation. Uh, if we can go ahead uh, and start, let's go ahead to the very first slide, Carrie. Uh, I want to start out with just a little bit of a disclaimer. You know, I'm, I'm not an epidemiologist, I'm an economist. so. I can't offer you any projections as to when the virus will peak and to the extent the virus, what damage it will cause on, on, on the population. Uh, I'm not gonna be offering any judgment on the political process, although I do have some opinions. I think maybe things were a little bit slower than they should have been. And, and I'm only gonna be discussing the economic impact of the virus on the region and how it's gonna play out in Houston. So with that said, let's go to the next slide. Uh, right now, we're really in a, quite an unprecedented situation. Uh, we haven't had, a, uh, not since we had the, the Spanish flu back in the, the 1917, uh, 1918, we had a, an incident that affected us so severely. Uh, it's been a challenge as an economist to figure out what's going on because the situation changes daily. Uh, I think on Sunday, it looked like we were gonna come back uh, around Easter time. And now it looks like the, the president says we won't be coming back till the end of, of April for things to, to be getting back to, back to work, back to maybe back to normal. You know, there, there's so many unknowns out there. Uh, and part of those unknowns is because the data is lagging. Uh, everything has happened so quickly for us that uh, we're just not getting a, a, a good read on what's happening in the economy. Uh, here we are at the end of March and the, the most current data we actually have is for uh, January and maybe part of February. And because that data is, is lagging in the way it comes out, we're not getting a good picture yet on actually what's going on. So let's go to the next slide, Carrie. Uh, the coronavirus, I put that up there, probably seen that on a lot of websites and so forth. Uh, that's what the little bugger looks like. So let's move beyond that to some actual data. Uh, as of 9 a.m. this morning, there were uh, over 800,000 confirmed cases in, in the world and 39,000 cases, 39,000 deaths in the world. Next slide, Carrie. 
this gives you some idea of the number of cases by country. And you can see, once again, this as a, a, of yesterday, you can see the U.S. at, at uh, approximately 140,000 cases. I went online just before we started the webinar, and we're already up to 160,000. So it shows you just how fast things change. Uh, after you can see Italy, and you can see Spain, you can see China and Germany, and you can see where the, the major nations are in relation to uh, how they rank and, and the number of uh, confirmed cases they have. Uh, next slide, Kerry. Uh, this is the track of the COVID-19 virus in the U.S. Uh, things uh, started off fairly slowly, and then you can see that actual slope of the line. It's, it's actually almost skyrocketing. You can just see the, just the enormous number of cases that we've had. And this is where the concern comes from. We're all trying to make sure that we socially isolate, we socially distance, we, we, we stay at home and we work safe to try to vent that. Right now, it's a pretty steep line. We want to make sure that it doesn't become a straight up line for the number of cases. Next slide, Kerry. This gives you the states with the most cases in the US. Uh, I went and we pulled the top 10 cases. You can see New York. New York actually, New York State actually accounts for about half of all the cases in the US. Uh, Texas isn't among the top 10, but I figured that you'd want to see that. Right now, we're at just shy of 2,800 cases. But given the, the, the previous slide, the rate at which the infections are increasing, uh, I expect that to, to increase uh, fairly quickly as well. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, this is the chronology of the virus. Now you can see the first case was in Washington State in January of 21st. The first case was in Houston about two weeks later. Uh, a week later, we decided to cancel the rodeo to shut it down because we were worried about uh, the community spread. Uh, just five days later, we closed the restaurants and bars. Uh, a little bit more than a week later, we got the order to, to stay home, to work safe and be safe and the first death, Mark 26. So you can see, if you simply look at what's happened in Houston, in Houston within a period of, of just about three weeks, we went from having our first case to being ordered to stay home and having our first death. It gives you some idea just how rapidly the, the virus is, is proceeding. And when it, have it proceeds so rapidly, that makes part of the challenge of trying to gather the data on a real-time basis and understand just how the virus and the measures to combat the virus are combating the economy. Right now, we have media reports, we have press releases, we have anecdotal evidence, but once again, we won't have actual data for a while yet, uh, even, even on the employment. I'll get to that when I talk about an, an employment slide. So let's go ahead, uh, Carrie, let's go to the next slide, please. Uh, this gives you some idea of the distribution of the cases in the Houston MSA, and that was as of yesterday, yesterday morning. Uh, about two-thirds of the cases are in Harris County, and that makes sense because about two-thirds of the population is in Harris County. Uh, don't expect that distribution to vary much over time, but we do expect there to be more cases. Okay, Carrie, next slide. So, pick your metaphor. This thing is coming at us. Is it coming at us either as a speeding train or maybe it might feel like just a piano has been dropped upon us because everything's happening so quick and so severe that it's just almost unfathomable. Let's go to the next slide, Carrie. Uh, just an example, here are two headlines. You can look on, on February 12th, the Dow closed at, at a record. And we were pretty much dismissing uh, the worries of the coronavirus. And we actually were seeing oil prices rise. And just two weeks later, uh, stocks suffered their biggest weekly loss. And we started to worry about the unease from the economic fallout. Let's go to the next slide. This just gives you some idea of, of how fast the Dow has fallen. And you see it's following a very typical pattern that we see in, in a lot of downturns, a lot of recession. A steep one day fall, and then a slight pickup the next day, a steep one day fall, and a slight pickup the next day. But we almost never get back to where we were the prior day. Uh, given the unease in the market, the unease over the economy, how investors are very concerned uh, about uh, the long-term outlook, I fully expect the Dow to continue to decline, even with the seamless package that was in place. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, how about this one at oil prices? January 3rd, oil prices surge after the U.S. strikes uh, kills Iranian militant leader. And we were actually worried at the beginning of the year about threats to the world's crude supplies. And we were seeing forecasts that crude could go up to $70, $80 a barrel because we expect there to be an outbreak of violence in the Middle East and crude supplies be cut off. 
And then just go back to, to yesterday's headlines. Shell producers asked Texas to cut oil output. There are actually two companies that went back to the Texas Railroad Commission and asked the Texas Railroad Commission if they would consider invoking rules which they hadn't used uh, since the 70s, rules that had been in place since the 20s, when the Texas Railroad Commission's responsibility was actually to regulate the production of crude in Texas, that regulated the production of crude because we had such a glut. Uh, that hadn't been an issue since the 70s, but now we've got this issue again. And you're actually seeing someone out there in the oil industry says, maybe we should go regulate production. Uh, and it, it's interesting that OPEC has actually invited members of the Texas Railroad Commission to come in and sit down in the next meeting to discuss how to get the oil markets back in shape. Let's go to the next slide. You can see what's happened with crude prices. You can see how they were uh, briefly above $60 a barrel earlier in the year and now how crude prices have fallen to around $20 a barrel. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Uh, job market, we had 113 consecutive months of job ads in the US. We had what had been the longest expansion in US history. We had an absolutely phenomenal jobs report in January, we had 225,000 jobs. That was, and, and then all of a sudden, here we go, we start having the concerns of the coronavirus and layoffs, and you, everyone probably saw the headlines last week, record rise in unemployment claims, halts historic run of job growth. This is one of the examples I'm talking about, one of the challenges we have in trying to understand what's going on in the economy with the coronavirus. Uh, the most recent data we have is for January, and that was well before we had this issue with the coronavirus. The next report we're gonna come out is March. We won't get the March report. We'll get the March report a little bit later on this week. Uh, but the March report, the way the Bureau of Labor Statistics gathers the data, they're gonna know how many people were on payroll in the week that included March 12th. And that was just before we started, or just as we started with, with the layoffs, just as we started the work in place, work safe, stay safe. And so even the data we get from March is not gonna give us a full true picture of the impact on the job market, on the economy. It won't be until we get the April data and we don't get the April data until the first week of May that we see actually uh, a jobs report that shows some idea of how much it's impacted. But we do get a little bit of an idea by looking at the unemployment claims. Let me go to the next slide. And you can see just how we were just kind of, kind of plodding along uh, in, in the US uh, at, at around 200,000 initial claims for unemployment insurance. And then with all the layoffs which occurred that second, third week of March, you can see how they shot up. We had 3.3 million uninsurance uh, claims for unemployment insurance. So let's go to the next slide. So are we in a recession? Uh, that's a question uh, everyone's asking. Let's go to the next slide. So this is Jerome Powell. This is the Federal Reserve Chairman. And as recently as, as March 26, just a few days ago, he said the economy may be in a recession, uh, but the virus will dictate the timetable of any recession. Uh, I guess you have to give, uh, understand a little bit where Crowell's coming from, because if the chairman of the Fed comes out we're in a recession, that may send additional panic to the markets. They're already struggling enough as it is. So he's probably reluctant to come out right now and say we're in a recession. But there are people out there who are saying we're in a recession. Let's go to the next slide. This is put together by, uh, this is what you're seeing as some of the, the major banks, some of the major financial institutions, and their take on what GDP is going to be like uh, this year. You can see Goldman Sachs, Credit Suisse, UBS, Barclays, JP Morgan, Deutsche Bank, and all but Deutsche Bank are saying that in Q1, we're already starting to see a decline in GDP, a decline in gross domestic product. And you can see for Q2, uh, they're, they're seeing a decline and the decline gets much worse. And they're saying you don't see much of recovery until Q3. And if you look at that very far column on the right-hand side, you can see all of them are showing that the way the year ends up, will uh, GDP, the size of the economy, will actually be smaller at year's end than it was when it began. Uh, I do want to give a, a shout out to Scott Davis with Location Strategies helped me with this, and Roel Martinez in my department helped me with this, trying to pull this together. But uh, two takeaways from the slide. One is that, yes, we are already in a recession. The other is it's gonna be worse in Q2. Uh, we're hoping that things will start to get better in Q3, but however we end up the year, we'll end up the year uh, worse off than we began the year. So let's go to the next slide. So just a few comments. The pandemic is gonna determine the recession's length and its depth. Uh, 
most recessions are brought on by an event. If you think about the recession of 08, 09, that was brought on by the collapse of the financial markets. If you look at the, rece the recession of, of 01, 02, that was brought on partially by the, the attack on the World Trade Center and a, and a sudden loss of business confidence. If you want to go all the way back to the recession we had in 91, 92, that was brought on by the first Gulf War and the spike in oil prices. This recession, the event which has brought on this recession is the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus and the business community's response to that. Now there's been a, a real, rather hefty stimulus package that was passed last week, $2.2 trillion. Uh, that's absolutely phenomenal. That, that's equivalent to about 10% of US GDP last year. An, another way to look at that is uh, I went uh, online to try to put that in perspective and there are reports out there that says the US spent a total of $4.1 trillion on World War II on munitions and supplies and soldier service and so forth. So basically the stimulus package that we passed is equivalent to about half of what we spent at World War II. Um, I think the uh, metaphor is probably fairly apt because we are at war with the coronavirus. It is something which is uh, disrupting our lives and could potentially disrupt it for a lot longer if we don't get things in check. And then my third bullet point there is that whatever happens as a result of the coronavirus, the collapse of food prices is just gonna add to Houston's misery. So whatever happens to the U.S. economy, you need to add just a little bit of oil price collapse on top of that to understand what's going on in Houston. So let's go to the next slide, Carrie. Okay, so we're trying to understand just how bad the impact will be on Houston. What's going to be the depth of this recession that, that we are in? And there, and there are two ways to do that. You can try to model it based on assumptions, or you can look at history. And I just want to share with you the work of, of two other economists I have a great deal of respect for and show what they're modeled. Uh, let's go to the next slide, Kerry. Okay, this is work done by Bill Gummer at the Institute for Regional Forecasting. It, it's, it's real, it might, you might think it's a little bit busy. I'm not asking you to try to read everything on there, but basically Bill has run, he's come up with about 18 different scenarios of the way the COVID virus and oil prices could play out. And if you read through the background and methodology on this, he's currently saying he thinks the most likely scenario is that by the time the year is over with, Houston will still be down by about 44,000 jobs. Okay, let's go to the next slide, Kerry. Okay, now this once again is an, another fairly busy slide. This is something that was just put out by Ray Perryman from the Perryman Group. And it's interesting, if you think about it, between Bill Gilmer and Ray Perryman, they both have been studying combined probably the Houston economy for 80 years. They have lots of history. So they really feel they understand it fairly well, which they do. And if you can look, just go to the lower right-hand corner and you can look at what Perryman's forecast. And Perryman's, Perryman's models, he's forecasting at about 255,000 jobs lost in Houston during the outbreak. Both are very well-respected men, very strong economists, very good models, but they both come up with very different forecasts. And so let's go to the next slide. So what you're looking at is in the Institute for Regional Forecasting, they're looking at by the end of the year, Employment will be down by 44,000 jobs. If you're looking at uh, Ray Perriman's forecast, Perriman Group, they're looking at 256,000 jobs. Part of what you're seeing is just all the uncertainty because we don't know how long the virus is gonna last and we still don't have really good strong data sets to know how it's impacting the economy. But let's go, let's go to the next slide. And this is when I talk a little bit about history and how you try to look at history to get some understanding of how it will impact what I've got there is I've got five recent recessions up there. Uh, the top recession is the one, the oil price bust. The, the second one, the June 91, December 91, was associated with the first Gulf War. The May 01, June 03 one, that's associated with 9-11 uh, and the drop in business confidence. 08, 09 is the Great Recession. December 14, June 16 was the fracking bust. But I want to draw your attention to what I highlighted in blue there. And that's to try to give you some idea of when we've had these downturns, how many jobs have been lost, not necessarily on an absolute basis, but what has been the impact on the economy? And if you go back to the worst recession used to never had, and that was during the, the oil price collapse of the 80s, and Houston lost 13% uh, of its jobs, it lost like one in every seven, one in every eight of the jobs that it had. Uh, if you go back to the most recent downturn, and that was the one associated with the fracking bus, and that's at the very bottom. We only lost five tenths of a percent uh, from peak to trough. And that was because almost all the jobs were lost in the oil and gas sector. 
And we did lose jobs in the other sectors because the rest of the US economy and the global economy was still doing fairly well. And so the question is, what one of these would we like to say? When I, when I look at these, I'm trying to figure out, okay, given what I know about the economy today, given the way I know the economy tends to perform when oil prices fall, given what I know about how the economy performs when the US is struggling, what would be a, a likely scenario? And I, I'm, I'm thinking as I look at this, and as I read the business reports, and as, as I look at the data that I do have, and as I talk to my fellow economists, and I talk to the other people out there tracking the data, we're likely gonna see this downturn is gonna look like something somewhere between the Great Recession, which we had in 08 and 09, and the oil price bust that we had in the 80s. Let's go to the next slide. So one of the ways, one of the things that kind of gives me some insight into this is, is I tried to figure out one of the true data sets that we have is these unemployment insurance claims that, that were released last week, which made the headlines. Uh, almost 3.3 million in the US, but I figured, okay, how many were in Texas? That's where you see that approximately 150,000 there. I figured, okay, if Houston accounts for roughly a fourth, 24.4% of all the jobs in the US, it probably accounted for about one fourth of all the unemployment insurance claims or one fourth of all the layoffs. And so we're looking at mid-March, that one week in mid-March, we probably lost close to 38,000 jobs. And that was the first week. And what we'll probably see is unemployment insurance claims continue to climb as people, more people are laid off, as more people are able to get through the system because the system was bogged down, as people understand how to file. And we're likely to see unemployment insurance claims rise over the next few weeks until they start to fall off. And until we get that data on how many people have been let go uh, from the Texas Workforce Commission, we're gonna have to be relying on this unemployment insurance claims data. So let, let's just say, to make the number fairly round, fairly even, let's just say we're looking at a, a loss of about 40,000 jobs a week over at least the next three to four weeks. So Carrie, let's go to the next slide. So focus on the top two bullet points. If we were looking at the 80s energy bust where we lost 3.2% of all jobs, applying that to today's level, that would say that if we had a, a repeat of the 80s, we would lose over 400,000 jobs. But if you say, no, this is gonna be more like the Great Recession, and in the Great Recession, Houston lost, Houston lost four and a half percent of its jobs, uh, apply that to where we are today, 10 years later with the size of the economy, the size of the workforce, you're looking at a loss of, of probably about 140, 150,000 jobs. So I haven't come up, I can't say I've got a forecast and this is the number to, to the nth de de decimal point of how many jobs we're going to lose. But I'm I feel fairly comfortable saying that we will probably lose in this downturn over 150,000, but, but less than 400,000, probably less than 350,000. But I think easily we're gonna lose 150,000 and we'll see how well the stimulus package gets, kicks in and how soon we can go back to work to see if that 150,000 gets up to 200 or 250,000 or 300,000. But easily, I have, I have no problems looking at the data, looking at how we performed in the past and saying this economy will probably lose 150,000 jobs this year. That last bullet point that Secretary Steve Mnuchin, he said the US is gonna lose 20% of its jobs or could potentially lose 20% of all the jobs. And I simply took 20% and applied it to the size of Houston's economy today and that'd be a loss of 630,000 jobs. Now, I don't know whether Mnuchin, uh, Steve Mnuchin, Mnuchin is running a model or whether he just pulled a number out of the air. I, I think part of why he was saying 20% was Congress is very slow to act to pass a stimulus package. And what Mnuchin was trying to do is just drive home the seriousness of the downturn to try to get Congress to go ahead and pass that package. And I really don't think we would hit a 20% unemployment rate in Houston. So let's go to the next slide. So uh, let's talk about what industries are impacted, what will be impacted. Initially, the industries impacted are gonna be those that are, that are affected by social distancing. That's real easy to understand. Those are gonna be the bars and the restaurants and, and the retail, the ones that are, are real obvious to everybody. Uh, also initially will be those whose services can't be delivered remotely. I'm still seeing advertising for plumbing and air conditioning services, but also there's reluctance of households and consumers to allow a stranger into their house to fix something and they don't know if they're bringing the virus in with them. That's an example of a service. Uh, 
things which are not considered essential. Uh, if you need to know what is considered essential, you can go to the Department of Homeland Security. There's a very detailed listing there of all the essential industries. But I want to let you know what is considered essential. Things that are considered essential are things like transportation and chemicals and refining and the support services to support those industries and construction and so forth. So in that regard, those are, are, are fairly well off. What's not essential are, are things like the arts, which I disagree with. I think it's, they're essential, or bookstores and so forth. And also, uh, most small businesses are really suffering right now. They, small businesses, by their nature, tend to operate on very thin margins, and they don't have a lot of reserves. And if they have any cash reserves, they're usually putting it back into trying to grow the business. So small businesses are really at a, at a threat. That's who impacted initially if this thing carries out for the next, as this thing carries out over the next four to six weeks. Next slide, Carrie. But if we are still dealing with the coronavirus after May, every job is at risk. Every sector is at risk. Because that means that the economy has been shut down for, for 10 or more weeks. And even if you're working at home, even if uh, you're, you're uh, able to provide services, the money is not going to be coming in and we're going to start seeing layoffs beyond the initial ones that we've seen. Guys, I'm sorry, my earbuds keep on popping out. They were a present and I should have tried them earlier. So, okay, let's go to the next slide. So an example of services that can't be delivered, you can see air transportation, arts and entertainment, bars, restaurants, daycare. There is a provision as daycare being an essential service if it's daycare for the workers that are working in hospitals and so forth like that, but just broad daycare. Employment services, those are contract workers. When everything's shut down, you're not gonna be bringing people on contract and so forth. But it kind of gives you an idea that in, in Houston, just that, the, the real obvious ones, that's about 777,000 jobs. You're looking at about one in four, one in five jobs uh, are in that category that services can't be delivered remotely that are, are, are highly at risk. Uh, let's go to the next slide. This reflects a survey that we did of our members to give you some idea of just how much small businesses struggle. Uh, we sent a survey out last week, uh, got a good, good uh, what we felt was a good response rate. You can see 18% of our uh, small businesses are unable to receive supplies or services. 29% are unable to deliver goods or services. About a third have reduced headcount. 59% uh, are operating below capacity. And what's really scary is that 41% say they can survive only one to four weeks with the shutdown. That's why what we're hoping that with that stimulus package, which was passed last week, that money gets into the hands of the small business as soon as possible so we can keep them up and going and viable. Let's go to the next slide. So uh, I'm gonna leave this on the screen just for one moment because I know if I try to talk over it, everyone's gonna be reading it anyway. So I want you to take a look at that and then I'm gonna go down each one, uh, one at a time. Okay, let's talk about aviation. Flights have been cut 50 to 80%. Uh, that's part of social distancing, part of ban on travel. Uh, this will actually be probably one of the last sectors to recover. The aviation industry is going to struggle a lot longer than any other sectors, even when things supposedly get, get back to normal. Uh, there's data out there that people are going to want to continue to social distance even after the virus is over with. And so people are going to be reluctant to get on a plane with 150 other strangers in a confined environment for two hours, flying with recirculated area, recirculated air, to a city that's very far from home, worried that they may get sick on the plane or get sick somewhere else and not be able to get back home. Uh, chemicals and plastics, uh, we're still at operating at, uh, at normal capacity along the ship channel, but we're starting to see the global slowdown in manufacturing it is starting to see inventories build. It's interesting, you don't think about it with supply chains, but uh, when we aren't serving food in the fast casual, the fast food restaurants and so forth, there's a less demand for plastic cups and straws and, and carry out boxes and so forth. So that, that's another way it's having an impact. Construction, any, any projects which are underway now, they're likely gonna continue to fruition. But until we get some clarity on the direction of the economy and how bad things are, you're not gonna see any major new projects. Uh, home sales, talk to some of the people out uh, and the home builders, they say traffic and the model homes are down, but it's not down significantly just yet, maybe down 20, 25%. If you were started the year with the resolution that you were going to buy a new home and you're gonna move into a home and you have that set, you're probably gonna go ahead and, and finish that out. But if you uh, had not thought about buying a home, uh, that initial push is gonna to start to slow down. Traffic will probably be off 25% in March. We might see it off as much as 50% sales volume down in April. 
until we start to see things pick up. Uh, as far as resale homes, uh, we're starting to see fewer listings. Uh, if if I, I, what you're seeing is people don't want to put the house in the market because they don't want strangers coming to their house and looking at it. And you're also seeing the strangers saying, well, I'm not going to go into someone else's house that I don't know whether they have got the virus or whether I might pick it up. So you're going to start to see that impact on home sales. Hotels, they're, they're nearly empty and will be for a while. Uh, you could see a big pickup, though, with the hotels towards the end of the year when all the events that are on the books actually take place and all the events that were canceled earlier in the year try to squeeze in and get their event in before the end of the year. Multifamily, I do talk to a friend out there. They've done a survey, done some modeling. They think probably maybe 10% of their tenants won't be able to pay April's rent. Uh, hopefully that won't be the same for May, but you're starting to see the impact on multifamily. One thing is all the common areas are closed down with multifamily. Uh, you're trying to see people doing virtual tours and leasing virtually, but you're going to start to see leasing activity drop off of multifamily as well. Let's go to the next slide, Gary. Once again, I'm gonna leave this on the screen just for a moment and let everybody take a glance at it before I start to talk through it. Let's talk about nonprofits. Uh, you can consider nonprofits as both being nonprofits in the arts and nonprofits that provide social services. With social distancing, there are no fundraisers going on right now, so there's no way to have these, these galas and, and bring in the money which supports the nonprofits. And the donors who would be giving otherwise have probably looked at their 401, well, not their 401ks, they've looked at their, their portfolios and seen these declines are 20 and 30%. So with their portfolio shot, they'll probably will still be willing to give, but the size of their donations aren't gonna be as big as they were in previous years. So we're gonna see the nonprofit struggle. Office market deals that were close to being signed uh, two weeks ago are put on hold. Uh, you're gonna probably see a, a, a significant drop off in leasing activity. Probably the long-term impact is gonna be when you find companies that have been able to successfully telecommute, they're not gonna wanna take up much more uh, office space. They may, will, when the next lease comes around, they're gonna negotiate for a, a smaller footprint, which just does not bode well for the office market over the long term. Uh, I talked to someone who's in IT, they moved their entire call center home just before uh, we had the stay home mandate edict. Uh, he's tracking the productivity of the people who are handling the calls and they've actually found productivity has gone up when their, tele, their call center people are working from home than in the office. So they've already decided they're gonna cut back their space significantly when it comes time to renew the lease. Uh, Port of Houston traffic, we're seeing that the traffic is at normal levels. Uh, that's a good sign. Retail, this may be the final blow for some retailers. You probably saw Macy's has been struggling for a while. You saw that all their employees, most of their employees are on furlough. You also saw stage stores are struggling somewhat. Uh, so retail is gonna look a lot different. Vehicle sales were already trending down before the COVID-19. With people uncertain about their own finances, they're gonna be buying fewer vehicles. We'll see vehicle sales go down. And with the slowing in global trade, because just the general slowing of the global economy, uh, warehouse industrial space is going to, uh, you're going to start to see uh, rise in vacancy rates there as well. So Carrie, let's go to the next slide. Ooh, okay guys, I know that was a lot. Uh, it's kind of hard trying to summarize what's been going on with COVID in, in just uh, 20 or 30 minutes. I promise I'd give some insights on oil as well. So let's go to the next slide, Carrie. Uh, headline from CNBC pulled up just last night. Oil prices fall to 17-year low as Saudi Arabia, Russia's standoff continues, coronavirus hits demand. The, the OPEC meeting that was held in early March broke up because the Saudis wanted, wanted to cut back production and Russia, they wanted Russia to do as well. And Russia said, we've been cutting back production for the last three years and we've not seen the benefit from it. Uh, Alexander Novak has said something to the extent that Russia has held its production steady while, uh, while Texas producers have continued to, to produce and produce. Now it's time to stick it to, to the Americans. And that's pretty much what Russia wants to do. Russia wants to try to kill the U.S. shell industry. Uh, while Russia has held back its production, the U.S. shell industry has added another 3.6 million barrels a day of production. And so what this is, is it's really it's a, a duel between Saudi Arabia and Russia, who's going to control the oil markets. And Russia is caught in the middle. I mean, Houston is caught in the middle as, as Russia is trying to flex its muscle. So go ahead. Next slide. So you can see what's happened with oil prices. You can see how, see how, how steeply they've fallen. Uh, it's, it's hard to believe that just two months ago, oil prices were in the 60s and we were worried about them getting up 70s or 80s because of unrest in the Middle East. Next slide. 
This, this slide may be, my original heading on this was a, a very sobering slide. If you look at that first bullet point, that's where oil closed yesterday. The second bullet point was where oil closed at the lowest point in the energy bust of the 80s at $10.25. You adjust that for inflation, and 86 price in today's dollars is actually $24.37. So actually what we're seeing is that oil prices today are trading lower than they were at the lowest point in the energy price downturn. And I'll just be real honest with you guys, I'm still trying to get my head around this. I'm still trying to figure out to what extent this is gonna hurt Houston's economy. I know it's gonna hurt Houston's economy. I know we're gonna see downturn related to this, and I'm trying to figure out how I layer this on top of COVID. So let's go to the next slide, Kerry. So it really comes down to these two guys. What we need some help from. We need some help from Putin, and we need we need some help from Mohammed bin bin Salam, the Crown Prince. They need to come together and realize that they're not just hurting themselves; they're hurting the rest of the world. And, and Houston is caught up in that as well. If they could come to some sort of agreement, we could get oil prices back up. I think we'll probably see oil prices maybe get back up to the 30s by midsummer, but I don't think we're going to see them get back up to the 50s. I think they'll get back up to the 30s by midsummer because we're going to start to see production decline. So let's go to the next slide, Kerry. So what can we expect? I expect crude to remain in the low 30s uh, through the end of the year. I know it's in the 20s now. I don't think it'll get much above the low 30s at the end of the year without a Russian-Saudi deal. CapEx budgets, uh, they're already cut about 25 to 30 percent. I expect there to be another round of CapEx budget cuts as oil prices stay low. So we'll be spending uh, a lot less on exploration. The U.S. rig count is going to fall to levels of the fracking bust. Uh, during the bottom of the fracking bust, the rig count fell to just 404 rigs working. It wouldn't surprise me to see it get down to that same level. Uh, with fewer rigs working and with the way shell wells play out so quickly, I expect production to begin falling probably mid-year or, or maybe a little after mid-year. Uh, we lost 92,000, 94,000 jobs, energy jobs, during the fracking bust. Uh, we were able to make that up with growth elsewhere. Uh, we've gained back roughly 25, 30,000 of those energy jobs. I expect all the gains that we picked up in the last two years after the fracking bust will disappear in this go round. But uh, two years from now, we're, we're going to see consolidations. We're going to see bankruptcies. We're going to see companies simply shut down and say, I'm done with this. And two years from now, we're going to see a much leaner, much smaller industry. So next slide, Kerry. So and I'm trying to figure out, it was real difficult trying to figure out what would be some way to come up with an up, upbeat note on this, because I know you guys are sitting out there and this may seem depressing, but I, I've been asked before, if you had to use one word to describe Houston's economy, what would you use? And, and that's the word right there on the screen, resilient. Uh, you know, I showed you a slide. We've been through five downturns since the 80s, uh, six, depending if you want to count some of the really short downturns, we have, but five significant downturns since the 80s. Uh, and yet the economy is larger now and it's stronger now. It's more diverse now than it's ever been before. So I don't know how long this is going to last. I don't know how deep it's going to get. It's going to depend upon the virus. And it's real hard to try to model the virus. And as I said earlier, I'm not an epidemiologist. I'm an economist. But Houston's economy has always proven to be resilient. Uh, we will get through this. Uh, there's going to be some pain getting through it. But uh, on the other side, we will come out to be a, a stronger use. And with that, uh, thank you very much, Kerry. I'm done. Uh, do you want to put my last slide up? Yes, I'm um, bringing second. that up. Absolutely. And thank you, Patrick. Thank you for your there presentation. There you go. That's my favorite slide in the whole deck, guys. <laughs> so, okay. Your, your inspired slide. Thank you, Patrick, for that presentation. Uh, we do have some questions from our audience. Um, we'll take a few. We have a little bit of time right now. Um, one of the questions uh, that I think you just answered towards the end, but um, when the virus is over, do you see the jobs coming back? And I, and I do think you answered that question. You know, it depends, right? Everything yeah, really the, depends. The, the, a couple of things that you need to realize, there are going to be changes. The things which are going to derive the recovery are going to be the level of fear that people still have. Even if we see, even when we see the, the curve, we're on, the, on the, the downward slope of the bell curve and things seem to be getting better, there's still going to be some fear out there. So people are still going to be practicing social distancing. Uh, this whole thing has been a real shock to consumer confidence. It's going to depend upon how long it takes for consumer confidence to come back. 
how long it takes for people to feel like that they can go ahead and spend a little bit of money. They don't need to be sitting on it. Now, frankly, business confidence is, is somewhat shot as well because they're seeing what's happening with the consumers. Uh, there's going to be some industry restructuring. We're going to see that definitely in retail. We're going to see it in the office market. We're going to see it in oil and gas. Um, and there's going to be some permanent damage. There's going to be permanent damage to retail for sure. Mm -hmm. And so all that comes into place. Uh, I think at some point in 2021, we'll be fine. We'll be out of this. But don't ask me if that's the first quarter, second quarter, third quarter. You know, what you'd be doing is ask me to forecast 18 months in advance. And we've only got three weeks of, of COVID. 19 impact on the economy. So we really need to see a little bit more data points and see how things are playing out, so. It's a, it's a week by week thing. And, and just for our audience to know, uh, Patrick will join us again. We'll have him on frequently to give us updates on a regular basis as things do change. Uh, Patrick, we have several questions in our open Q&A line. However, several have been answered. And for our audience, please note that any answered questions by Patrick's team, um, you can see those on the Q&A bar. So the next question is from Chris. Uh, are we defining recession as two quarters of decline, question mark, or what would that look like? Okay, that's the conventional definition uh, that's often cited in the media is two uh, consecutive quarters of declining GDP, because that's the easiest to grasp. There's actually a group out there called the National Bureau for Economic Research that looks at this, and Congress actually passed a law in the 30s giving the National Bureau for Economic Research the mandate to date the, re they, they call it dating the business cycle, and there's a group out there called the Business Cycle Dating Committee, and what they look at is a decline, in a decline in economic activity across broad sectors of the economy. And they're looking at a decline in retail sales, a decline in employment, a decline in income, a decline in industrial production, a decline in GDP. And when they see that that decline has occurred in multiple sectors over an extended period of time, then they declare that yes, we're in a recession. That often coincides with the downturn in GDP, but uh, sometimes it doesn't. But, but generally what we're looking at to date a recession, you're looking at, and for Houston, if you're looking at a decline in retail sales, a decline in construction starts, a decline in employment, an uptick in unemployment insurance claims, a decline in income. And when you look at it across those broad sectors, that tells me, yes, we are in a recession. Okay. And, and do all of your forecasting, uh, this is from Stephen, do your forecasts take into account uh, small businesses, including the gig economy? Uh, it was a smaller component of our economy just a few years ago, let alone 30. Uh, that's, a, that's a good point. Uh, the gig economy is, is definitely a larger part of the economy than it was 10, 20, 30 years ago. It's also the most vulnerable because uh, in one sense, when you talk about gig economy, there are two types of gig, gigs economy. There's a gig economy where you do uh, computer programming or some sort of web design work remotely. There's also the gig economy where you work an event and you're the waiter at, at this gala, or you provide music at this function, or you go out and you have a, a short four month, four week contract to help uh, finish a project at a company. Uh, overall, yes, it does take into account the fact that the gig economy in both sense, whether it's gig as driving for Uber or gig doing computer programming, that's all at risk and subject to be cut back, uh, probably more severe than someone who's on payroll right now. So Houston's not the only community uh, going through this struggle, obviously, not like it was during Hurricane Harvey. Um, so this is more of a global question or a global trade question. Um, how do you see this affecting global trade? And then more specifically, as it um, grows, how do you see it potentially affecting uh, the port at this time and commerce? Okay, that's... that's I, I've talked to some of my fellow economists and read some in, read number of reports, and I think, well, China's coming back online, so that's going to help the global economy. The problem is China's coming back online, but you're you're seeing an outbreak all across Europe now. You're starting to see outbreaks in, in Africa, in the Middle East. You're starting to see outbreaks in Latin America. And so the global economy is going to be struggling until uh, the majority of countries have got the COVID virus in check, and we're starting to see a pickup on activity. And so, uh, and that won't be for, for, for a while yet. Like I said, I'm not sure how long it's gonna take. Once you start to see that pick up, you'll, you'll start to see a pick up in global trade. Now, right now we're still seeing plenty of activity going through, through the ship channel, 
But at some point, we're going to have a, a problem with where do we store the crude? Where do we store the refined products? Where do we store the plastics? And we're going to hit some point that there's already a real discussion about that is that with running out of space to store the crude, we may have to actually shut in wells to stop producing them, right. and stop them from producing. And, and so, uh, yeah, and, and that's the, and the global trade is so important, not just for the port of Houston, but for Houston in general. So part of Houston's recovery is going to be dependent upon when we start to see pick up in global trade. And I expect that as we start to get reports out over the next few months, we're going to see that global trade drop significantly in March and April and May and won't start picking up till the end of summer. Great. Thanks, Patrick. Um, Michael asked the question, and this, this really lends towards um, back to our annual meeting, Patrick, um, where Bobby Tudor talked about our energy industry and the transition. Um, do you see this situation with COVID accelerating the trend uh, towards energy efficiency and uh, the innovation in the energy sector? Uh, that's interesting. It's something I, something I need to think about in that regard, about the acceleration of it. One thing, you, you've probably seen the reports in the media of the smog over northern Italy and with them being on lockdown, how there's a lot less. So it definitely goes, there's some sense there that if we can travel less or pull more internal combustion engines off the, uh, off, off the roads or, or clean up industry, it, it, there's a benefit. But, but right now, there's just too much unknowns. Uh, for one thing, when oil is so cheap and gasoline is so cheap, the economic incentive is not as strong there. It would have to come more from a government mandate or, or, or someone with a very long time, for, time horizon. Uh, some of the funds that need to fund some of this energy 2.0, some of the more, uh, I'm trying to look for the right word, some, some of the more innovative aren't going to be there now because of the collapse in the stock market and the collapse of people's uh, financial wealth. If you're looking for venture capital, uh, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. I thought about that. I haven't had a chance to research it, but I imagine venture capital funds are not going to have quite as much wherewithal after this is over with as they would have had six months ago. And that could be something which slows the energy transition. It's definitely something we need to do, but this becomes a, a hiccup on the road to getting on that in, getting to that energy transition. Thanks, Patrick. Um, for our audience, if you want to use the chat function to comment or suggest any future programming for the Greater Houston Partnership, um, it, we can uh, convey that to Patrick and his team uh, to elaborate on maybe or drill down on a specific issue in the future. Uh, Patrick, from, um, uh, from another one of our audience members, do you have any additional insight on the impact of the health services it seems now they're very busy. They have a lot, uh, a lot on their hands right now. What does that look like in the short term and potentially long term? Um, it's interesting. Okay, you're, you're, I'm, I'm having to think on my feet about this right now. Definitely, the hospitals are, are busy and are going to get busier. Uh, but part of this, in the short term, there is that social distancing issue. Uh, I've gotten emails from my dentist and my daughter's orthodontist that they're not seeing any patients other than emergencies until this is all over with. Uh, you've got cancellation of, of, uh, of select elective surgeries and so forth. And so in the short term, you can see some aspects of healthcare actually suffering and other aspects being overburdened. Uh, one is underutilized and one is overutilized. Uh, there are a lot of things are going to come out of this. One thing is as a society, we'll probably sit back and figure out, okay, what, do, what actually should healthcare look like? What, what should we have stockpiled? What are we willing, excess capacity, are we willing to maintain over time so we have it whenever we have a situation like this uh, happens? You know, there is this concern uh, that there have been so many hospitals built in Houston that we may have too many beds. We're getting ready to find out whether that concern was valid or not. We may need all those beds in the next few weeks, and then six months from now, those extra bits may be empty and stay empty for a while. So it's, it's gonna be kind of hard to figure out just uh, what we need. That's probably more something a question that's better asked for a healthcare professional, an epidemiologist, or somebody who specializes in healthcare economics. But uh, it, it definitely you're seeing a, a split between those who are underutilized, like those in, in family practice, and those who are underutilized in family practice, and those who are overutilized in, in, in hospitals and emergency care and so forth. Patrick, thank you. Um, this is a population question from Jordan. What do you expect the impact to be on uh, population growth from people moving to or and potentially away from Houston? 
uh, as far as population growth, a bit of good news uh, that we got the data a week ago that showed Houston's population continue to grow. We actually had some positive domestic migration, meaning more people moved in than moved out for the first time in the last two years. We had lost some population because of the oil bus. We lost some population because of Hurricane Harvey. But it seems like people are starting to move back again. Definitely, I feel that from the out-of-state license plates. Uh, the issue, the, the COVID virus is affecting everybody. And so you can't say the COVID virus is going to have an impact on people moving to Houston. What will have an impact on people moving to Houston is the downturn in the oil and gas industry. And if those jobs aren't there, you may have people in energy that leave uh, because they can't find the job here. Uh, but the energy industry won't be drawing people to Houston like it has in the past. Thank you. Patrick, we're going to wrap up with this final question. And for those that we weren't able to ask your question, uh, either live or in our text, uh, we will take your question down and, and provide it to Patrick and his team and get back to you. We do have your names listed here. But th this final question, Patrick, and you mentioned it already in your slides, um, I think everyone's looking for a silver lining somewhere. Um, but again, would you share in the synopsis who you see the, the loser, the main losers, and I hate to use that term, but who, who's, who's really going to be hurt from this crisis? And wh who do you think the winners are going to be? And are there potentially winners out there we don't know about? The ones that are going to struggle the most that come out of this are going to be, uh, like always, small businesses because they do not have the, the resources that the uh, larger enterprises do. Uh, if you go back and look at that survey, some said they won't be able to survive four weeks if we remain shut down. Uh, you're going to see a, a loss in retail. Retail is going to be a big loser. Uh, I, I see that things not getting any better for the office market for quite some time. I think telecommuting is going to become more common because it looks like uh, it's working very successful. The winners, the big winners is anything that deals with technology, which allows us to telecommute, but continues to allow for e-commerce, that continues to allow us to, to maintain social distancing if we need to. Uh, also, I think that anybody who's doing Pharmaceutical research, I think we're going to see a lot of a big push to try to develop some more vaccines and medicines. And, and so I think healthcare, uh, I don't know how much money will flow to it, more money should flow to it, but I think the public awareness of the need to adequately fund healthcare is going to be out there. And I think that's something that there will be a, a, a both a winner and a bit of a loser because of uh, their resources being overtaxed right now. Well, Patrick, thank you so much for your time today. I know you are looking at this every day, every hour, um, and you'll be providing additional updates to um, our members and the business community through your economic um, reports. Uh, Patrick is also uh, has a podcast. I think every day there's new information, so you, you want to refresh as quickly as possible. Uh, but a lot of da Patrick's data and analysis is on our coronavirus page and will be on our recovery page as well. So again, thank you, Patrick, and thanks to your team for um, presenting today in our Houston Business Forum series. Thank you. All right, for our audience, just a few uh, final announcements. Our upcoming webinars um, this week are tomorrow at 4 p.m. We'll be featuring Senator John Cornyn, and he'll be talking about the federal stimulus discussion. And then on Thursday at noon, we will have a lender panel to talk about our federal aid programs. That will be a moderated panel as well. So we hope you will join us. Registration should have gone out for both of those today and yesterday. And then I'm gonna leave this slide up for those as we close the meeting today. Uh, you can either take a snapshot of this from your phone or from your computer, um, but we will leave it up if you want to re, uh, write them down as well. And we'll be ensuring that we send this out to all of our members for all the great resources and information at the Greater Houston Partnership that you can take advantage of right now. Again, thank you for joining us today and we will see you at a future webinar. Thank you.